Thank you for downloading this podcast from Emmanuel Church Lurgan. At Emmanuel, our vision is to help rewrite the story of Craigavon, Ireland and the nations with the good news of the Kingdom of God. We hope you enjoy listening to this message. Let's, uh, let's look into um, God's um, word together. Um, if someone, oh no, I can get it here. We've got it. We're all okay. Um, yeah, so over the, past, um, over the past couple of weeks, um, we have had a whistle stop tour um, going on. Uh, as we've went through the, the God story, it's probably felt like it's all been a little bit of a, a whistle stop because there's just so much in the story of God and how he has used people and what has been going on that it's been impossible to unpack all of that. I have landed with the, the exile and the prophets and tried to cover all of that in two weeks, so it's going to be really, um, really interesting. But how have we got to where we are um, already? We have had um, Joshua has been leading the people of Israel into the promised land. Um, you then have seen them moving into the period of the judges and then into the kings is what Phil was unpacking um, last night, and how David had got the nation to a place where it had centered itself uh, on worship of God, day and night worship of God. Uh, and this nation was focused in and centered. But then what happens after that in the cycle of kings that follow? There's very few of them that follow after God's way. And what we see is a cycle of escalating wickedness that is happening and that there's rejection of God that is happening again and again within each generation. There are idols being created, and there's compromise creeping in. So you have this nation that God has called, that he's given the seed of promise to, that he's saying, I want to bless you so that you can bless the nations. And this group of people, this family, this nation, is in absolute moral decay. Uh, The kingdom has now separated into the northern and the southern And into it, there's just these cycles of ongoing rejection and turning away um, from God. You see, wave after wave of people choosing to say no and generations saying no to everything that God has for them. You see the tide of sin increasing and increasing. And the important thing as we start into unpacking this next season is that we see the faithfulness of God even in the middle of that that as they continually turn their hearts away from God, get more creative in their sin than they could, that God is calling out for the soul of this nation and saying, come back to me, come back to me. And as we read through scripture and particularly the prophets of what we're looking at um, this morning, you can't help but see the patience and the persistence and also the passion that God has for his people, that he is longing with desperation of saying, come back to me, and that his arms are wide open um, towards them. And at that point, I would just love us to pause, and I would love you to reflect even on your own journey where you have experienced the passion, the patience, and the persistence of God, of God turning towards you, of calling you (coughs) passion, patiently, persistently going after you? And would it land thankfulness within your heart that you are going, God, thank you that you have done that for me. Thank you that you have rescued me. And then we we land into the prophets who are unpacking what is God saying into the generation. So Phil, um, very quickly last week, was unpacking the journey of the king's and sort of we're tracking along. And what we need to realize is that as we then land into um, the prophets, these 16 books of the prophets, they are not then following on chronologically. They are happening and interwoven into the stories of, of the kings. And if you take a quick sort of Google search, you will be able to see where and which prophets overlay and overlap with which kings. And they're speaking into each generation as they go. And there's this verse in Amos in one of the prophets that says um, this, for the Lord does nothing without revealing his secrets to the prophets. That God has chosen and taken this group of people and said, actually, I I, I want to share with you what I am doing. 
I want you to proclaim and to speak this out to the nation of what I am doing and what I am about to do. He says he does not want to do anything in secret. He wants to reveal it to the, the prophets. He is communicating. He's, he's endeavoring to enter into conversation of what is happening. And this is such a challenge for us today that, that as God's people, God is looking to speak to us. God is looking to communicate with us. There's a conversation he is looking to have with his people of saying, this is what I am doing. This is what I am up to. And how do we listen and how do we tune our hearts in to hear what God is saying? And that he, what he might be wanting to say through us to our nation and to the nations of the world, that God wants to speak to his people, that he wants to communicate um, through them. But you know what, as well, not only do we hear what God is saying through the prophets, <coughs> these, these, the people that have sort of crafted and written down what God has been saying into the nation, we also see and hear and feel the heartbeat of heaven. We get what God is feeling. It's not just what he's saying, but it's what he's feeling. And um, don't worry, Phil and I have no intention of taking any of these sort of, uh, the lead by any of these prophets, but he, he got them to do it in some really unusual ways. Isaiah, he got him to walk around naked for three years. Jeremiah had to hide his underwear for a while. And then you had Ezekiel, who then had to go and eat a scroll. Very unusual ways where God was going, Would, can I please just get your attention? Would you please turn your heart and your mind um, towards me? Would you turn your soul towards me? And there was a nation that was repeatedly, time and time and time again, turning its back on God. And then you get to Hosea, <coughs> one of these prophets who God tasks, and I, this one catches my heart because I can't imagine it. God gives him the task and he says, um, I want you to marry a prostitute. I want you to go and, and, and redeem this woman and to, to, to marry her. And he does that and you're sort of thinking, well, that's a... That's a beautiful story of God going on the rescue and redeeming us. But, but what happens then, even in that redemption, there are cycles of unfaithfulness where continually um, she betrays the intimacy with Hosea, that she is unfaithful to him. And time and time again, he welcomes her back in with this unfathomable embrace of forgiveness. And through the prophet Hosea, God is saying, this is what it feels like. This is what it feels like when you turn away from me. And we're holding this at a, a, a national level where he's speaking into this nation and saying, every time you turn your back on me, it feels like this. That level of pain, of the betrayal of intimacy, because I love you with such love, with such an extent. I love you that way. That it breaks my heart every time that you turn from me. And whenever we hold it at the national level, it's very easy for us to hide in the crowd. And yet we know that God deals with us as individuals. We know that God treats us. And one day that we stand before him not as the people from Emmanuel, not as the people that come from this island. We stand in front of him on our own. He treats us as individuals. And the same thing echoes true. It's like every time in my heart where I choose to go my own way, every time that I choose to reject the way that God is leading me, every time I choose to shut myself off from his love, he feels the pain of the betrayal because he loves us to that extent and the price that he was willing to pay for our redemption to bring us back in. And I think it's important for us to note as we look through the prophets, what is God saying? But what is God feeling? What is God feeling for us as a nation in how we treat and deal with him? What is God feeling for us even as a community of people that are endeavouring to follow after him? 
But what does it look whenever there's areas of our lives that we keep them at a distance? Or we blatantly go the opposite direction? The prophets show us not only what God is saying, but we see what God is feeling. And despite this repeated resounding call of come back home, I love you this way, come back home. The clear warnings of if you continue on this path, and this is the story of prophet after prophet, if you keep going this way, destruction will come. Ultimately, you will land in that place of rejecting your God and destruction will come. And that's what happens to the northern kingdom. We've said the two kingdoms have split. There's the northern and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom is completely destroyed by the Assyrians. It's wiped out. And then all hope is lasting and leaning on this southern kingdom, on Judah, of going, right, are you going to learn the lesson of you, as you've looked at the, the northern kingdom? Are you going to learn your lesson of what happens when, when you just continually and repeatedly reject God and the love that he's looking to lavish upon you? But this southern kingdom, this Judah con- continues and it wears cycle after cycle. And then around 135 years after the northern kingdom is destroyed, You see the southern kingdom going into exile. Seventy years of captivity in Babylon. And this is what we're going to focus in on a little bit this morning. In the the God story book it says this. um, The father's only chance of winning his people back in the long term is to let them go in the short term. Israel will experience God's love as judgment. God is always orientated to humanity in love. God never stops being love. Therefore, God's actions are never to get back at us. Only his consent for us to suffer the consequences of our reckless and idolatrous rebellion. This is what we call the wrath of God. Israel has invited God's judgment upon herself. The the wrath of God is suffering the consequences of our own relentless rebellion. Relentless rebellion that has been met with this relentless, lavish love of God. The, the, the love of God that restrains and holds back the consequences of our sin. But God, in the hope of eventually winning them back, gives them over to their own rejection of him. And they land themselves in exile. And they're having to try and figure out what does it look like to follow God in this foreign land. Figure out your faith, your belief, your belonging in this unfamiliar territory. And this is the darkest moment of Israel to date. Where it feels like the promise is gone. No nation, no land, no temple, no hope. That they have landed in a place where they've got what they've asked for. We've rejected and we've got, we, we don't want you involved. And they're sent into access. And yet in this moment, uh, their darkest moment, you again see who Yahweh is. The great I am who I am. You see who our God is. Because this God goes with them into access. God continues to be good and faithful. And he would partner with this remnant that are remaining and are willing to learn his ways. Who would not be consumed or morphed 
by the superpower or superculture of the day. But in all the deconstruction would be reconstructed into his treasured possession. Reconstruction would come if they trusted the process. Jeremiah's words, I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile, offered this hope. Israel had not acted as God's children should. They were experiencing God's wrath as purifying love. But they were still his children, the apple of his eye. In Babylon, stripped of everything, God was reconstructing his treasured possession. So what did it look like to be reconstructed in this foreign land? What did it look like to be built again after everything that had happened? Landing in this place of exile. And this is where we want to turn our attention in the time that we had left to Daniel and his friends. So let's look at Daniel chapter 1 and verses 1 to 10. It's on the screen, very small. But if you've got your Bible with you, you can look it up. It says, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names, to Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official to, for permission to, Um, not to define himself this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. Uh, But the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord the king who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? And the king would then have my head because of you. And uh, he, He goes on to let Daniel test and try this and he proves that actually God is in it. And I suppose let's look at this story for a little bit of Daniel, of Hananiah, of Mishael and Azariah and these Jewish lads that have landed themselves in the middle of Babylon, probably in their mid to late teenage years, landing themselves in this um, foreign land. But let's also remember where they came from because these guys were not coming from a nation that was centered on God's presence. Remember generation after generation after generation of turning their back on him. That it was just an absolute chaos and decay what was going on. They maybe had some of the traditions and rituals, but they had none of the heartbeat of what was going on in the earlier years of this um, nation. They were coming from a broken civilization. And these guys are so are are, are grabbed out of that place and landed into Babylon. And you wonder, what is it that sparked such level of resilience and faith within them? Because if we're reading it right, the, the, the moral compass of the nation was not set on God. Worship was not centered upon him. Their hearts were for him. That's why they've landed into exile. So were these four young men an exception to the rule? that were already standing out and trying to be faithful to their God, regardless of what everybody else was doing? Or was it that in 
the, the, the extreme of being pulled into exile, the shock to the system that it awakened something within them to go, we need God. And they lent in to his presence. You see, sometimes whenever we get the stark reality of our situation, it causes us to go, actually, I, I need God. Whenever we, we realize the reality of what we're facing, we go, I need God. And there's been countless people that that's been their journey into relationship with God. It's actually in that moment when everything comes crashing down that we've nowhere else to turn but to God. But regardless of, of, of whether they were being, it, while they were in Israel, their, their hearts were pounding with passion for God or it was actually in the reality of just landing into this space that we're going, actually, we, we, we need him. We need him. It was really clear from early on in the passage that we've read that they are determined to set their hearts on him. It says that they don't want to be defiled, that they're not going to be squashed with the culture that they are part of. And the, the, the Babylonians had an agenda. That it was intentional. It wasn't just let's just wait and see. They were taking them. They were taking them for three years. They were saying, you're going to learn our language. You're going to learn our literature. You're going to know what it means and feels like to be a Babylonian. We're going to take you and we're going to shape you. We're going to mold you. We're going to morph you into what we want you to be. These young men that were coming with full of potential within Israel, and they're, they're, they're ripped out of that environment and said, you know what, we're going to make you forget where you came from. We're going to make you forget who you belong to. We're going to give you our literature. We're going to tell you our story so that you will forget your own story. We're going to take your name and we're going to give you a new name so that you will forget where you came from, who you belong to, and your identity. We're going to shape you. We're going to mold you. We're going to morph you. And the reality is that all of us, regardless of our age, are being shaped and formed by something or someone that is trying to tell us their better story and to create our identity. We're being shaped and we're being morphed by someone. And at this stage, the, these Young people are grabbed, late teens. Why pick them? Because at that stage of life, everything is so easy to influence. Everything is so easy to influence. They're, 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 you know that stage where you're, you're getting into your later teens and you have a little bit more freedom that's coming from your parents? You're, you're, you're into that young adult stage where you're out and you're, you're working or you're up and you've got the freedom of university and there's there's choices and decisions that you can make. Everything is up for grabs in that moment of who you're becoming. And they, the Babylonians weren't stupid. They went, let's get them at that age. Because if we get them at that age, we can set the course of their life. And that's why I'm so excited that we've got Ryan in the role that is leaning in around that young adult age. Because that is an extremely influential age. Where we are being shaped into who we are becoming. <laughs> where we're figuring out what the trajectory of our life is and what our identity is. And all I would say is, if you're here this morning and you're finding yourself in that bracket, that late teens, just be careful of who you're letting influence you. You're, you've got that sort of freedom of into work and into uni. Be careful of who you're letting shape and morph, morph you. <laughs> creating your worldview, creating your inner world, creating your moral compass. Because if it is not being shaped by God and his word, it is being shaped by something else. If it's not being shaped by God and his word, it's being shaped by something else. Um, no one likes to be the odd one out. But that's what these four young people had to do. They had to be the odd one out. Out. You know those days whenever the letter comes home from school, for any of you that are parents, that the kids have to dress up, that it's dress up day? Teachers, why do you do it to us? <laughs> um, and then all of your creative energy has to get poured into presenting your child. 
is a creative masterpiece and you send them out with pride into their classroom only to realize that you've got the dates muddled up the room the wrong day and they're a parrot and everybody else is in school uniform. And all I could think is, if I had another week, just imagine what I could have done with that costume. But no one likes to, to, to be the odd one out. No one likes to land in and be standing out from the crowd, but this is exactly what <coughs> these young men had to do. Not only from the Babylonians, hear this because this bit's really important. They didn't just have to stand out from the Babylonians, they had to stand out from every other young person that was swept into exile. We hear the story of four of them, of all of the young people that were swept up and gathered into exile. There's four of them that are saying, we're, we're not going to do it this way. And sometimes we can set the bar by those around us. Sometimes we can set the bar by those who are around us within church. And actually, here's the example of sometimes we need to step out and not go with the crowd, not go with the popular opinion. There are certain things that we shouldn't do, certain conversations that we shouldn't be part of. Not out of rules and regulations, hear me. Not out of, oh, you can't do this and you can't do that. Not out of fear, but out of choice, because you're making a decision for all of us in the room to say, I want to set myself apart for God. I do not want to be defiled, or the other word for that is polluted. I want to set myself apart for him. And you know the beautiful thing that then happens as they set themselves apart, as they trust God. They are met with the favor of God. I've lost track of this a wee bit. There we go. They are met with the favor of God. <coughs> um, we read, now God caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. To these four young men, God gave, and it's understanding, learning of literature, miraculous interpretation of dreams and visions. There was none equal to these four. They entered into the king's service. They, they were 10 times better than anyone else in the kingdom. In chapter two, you read about how they were promoted to places of influence that were probably beyond their years. And we track this the whole way through Daniel's life. Because they made a choice to be formed by God rather than the culture that they were part of, to stand out and be out, step out of the crowd, to be the odd one out at times, that the favor of God followed them. That little word, is, I don't want to be defiled, is, is polluted. And I am not standing here. There's so much in our culture to redeem that is beautiful. But there's some things that are rubbish. And they will pollute our souls. They will pollute our minds. They will pollute our hearts. They will clutter our souls that there's little or no space for God and his spirit. So how do we make a choice to go, I'm not going to let my soul get polluted. I'm not going to let it get diluted. I'm standing out and I'm setting myself apart for God. And God responds to people time and time again through scripture and through history who set themselves apart for him. In Daniel chapter 6 verses 3 to 5 says this, Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it is something to do with the laws of his God. Imagine living a life set apart for God in that way. That even the people that are out to get you are saying, we can't find anything against them. We can't find anything against them. They're living their lives in a way that they're trying to honor and follow after their God. And as we close, you have that we are, are forged, we're formed. We've got the, the favor of God, but we are forged in the fire as well. 
Each of these people had a crunch point in their life. For Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it was whenever they were being forced to worship an idol. Nebuchadnezzar had put a gold statue up and said, everybody must bow. Uh, and in their younger years, they, they, they were having to stand out from the crowd again and say, we're not going to bow. They were already in places of influence, positions of power. And they were saying, we're not going to bow. We're, we're giving this all up because God's too important to us. God is too important to us. They land themselves into the fiery furnace. Their words are these. We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we were thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will never, um, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hands. But even if he does not, we want you to know your majesty that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Such resilience. They would not bow to the idol of their age. Um, in our country, we don't have many gold statues set up that we're told to bow down to, but what are the idols that we have in our hearts and our lives that come before God? What are the things that are more important to us than him? What are we willing to bow to? And the example of these guys is that God stood with them when they landed themselves into the fiery furnace. God was with them. The fourth person is seen as they land into the fiery furnace. And if you're wondering where um, our Daniel is, he's to wait a little bit longer till his crunch moment comes. He's in his 70s. Whenever there's a plan hatched against him to stop him praying, praying that shaped and formed him and made him who he was, that conversation and dialogue with God that he was not given up. Does, is our prayer life that important to us that we would risk the lion's den for it? Has it shaped and formed us in such a way that we wouldn't let it go and that we would face the wrath of the king thrown into the lion's den? And again, Daniel in his 70s has to go again. Of going, God, you have me. You have me. I am yours. And maybe so much of what we have talked about this morning is orientated around young people in that sort of prime of life and making decisions. But Daniel had to do this in his 70s. He had to make the call and he had to make the decision. I'm going to invite the worship team up just as we close And you know what? These, both of these stories have the beautiful outcome where God stands with them in their fire and their lives are saved. Where Daniel, the, the mouths of the lands are shut and he is rescued. But equally through scripture, we see people who have taken their step and faith and risk for God and they have paid the price with their life. We've seen it through history as well. And we even hear and know of it happening around our world at this moment where people are saying, God is more important to me than my life. People who are willing to stand out from the crowd. Can we stand together? Holly's going to lead us into just worship and this is our response. Our prayer ministry will be at the front and back if they just come and make themselves available. But as we lean in on this song, may it be our response to him. And if you're going in the, in the core of who you are, God, I want to be set apart, then just tell him. Ask him for the strength to do that. Ask him for the courage to do that. Because if you want to be able to do it in the big things, in the moments, Whenever Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego had to say no to bowing down to the idol or for Daniel, whenever there was a decree that he couldn't pray. If you want to be able to do it in the big things, there are a hundred choices that we make every day to choose him and say yes to him and to set ourselves apart for him. Let's close our eyes together. We hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast. 
For more information about our church and all that we do, please visit our website at emmanuel-church.co.uk.